Gathered, gathered in the midst of this beautiful day, this beautiful season, gathered at one and the same time in the midst of crises, national and global, gathered with whatever personal challenges or joys we are in the midst of, gathered, gathered to worship, to lift and hold before us those values, those things of greatest worth those people, those dear ones of greatest uh, worth for us in our lives, gathered to worship, to reflect on the days past, to be present here, to prepare for the days to come, gathered on this ancient hillside, this the ancestral land of the Massachusetts people, this the land on which this building made sacred by love was constructed so long ago. We have gathered once again, and it is good to be gathered. Sing a new world and you where the homeless find a where no children ever hunger, but are filled with God shalom. Where all people work for justice, where all hate and vengeance cease. Sing a new world into being, raise the Lighter is Chris Sullivan. Chris, thanks so much. A reading from Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. with feathers hope our opening hymn you can find it in your gray hymn books number 347 gather the spirit as usual in these times we invite you to follow along perhaps to hum or sing very quietly as we enjoy hearing our soloists lead the way gather the spirit <laughs>
and a warm welcome to worship in our old ship and from our old ship meeting house. Welcome to you all here in the room. Welcome to you all on the screen. Welcome. We're always delighted to have those who've been with us like forever. And we're delighted to have anyone who might be a newcomer. If you are new or visiting and would like to introduce yourself, I would ask you to stand, keep your mask on and tell us who you are so that we might offer a warmer welcome, if you like. Any courageous newcomer. Well, we're glad to see everyone here. Yes, please. Well, great, great to have you with us, Isaac, with our old friend and yours, Linda Lindgren, this morning. Thank you. Welcome. Well, everyone is welcome on the screen here in the building. If you are here in the building, you're welcome to gather in fellowship following the service just outside or across the street to where we're having a Bikes Not Bombs bike collection. We haven't done this for quite some time. I already saw this morning uh, a dozen or more bikes in the parish house that people had left. I left my old Peugeot, which I'll be donating. Bikes Not Bombs is a fabulous organization. They've been at it for decades. They take these old bikes, rehab them or use the parts and they're given to kids in, in Roxbury and taught, kids are taught how to make bikes, how to uh, ride safely. They're spread around the world, in countries in Africa and Central America to serve as transportation, uh, sometimes uh, to pull a cart by, for someone who's um, making sales or deliveries it's a splendid organization. They would just take your money too. So that's also welcome. And if you can, when you bring your bike, you, you give them $10, so that's not required. Uh, so feel free to move across the street uh, to be part of that celebration. One other announcement, as you may have seen in our newsletter, we are adopting here at Old Ship 10 families who are living in shelters, uh, adopting them for the holidays. And there are details in the newsletters, a total of 36 men, women, and children. And you can see the details and contact Davaline Cooper uh, if you have questions or want to participate. Her contact information, if you don't have it, is also in the newsletter. And finally, as we've been saying each week, uh, for good reason, if you are at all uncertain about your footing, we have this beautiful ramp going out on this side of the meeting house uh, to avoid the steps. And once again, welcome. From the time for all ages, uh, I'm going to take this off so you can see me, uh, is a story taken from Jane Goodall's current book written with Douglas Ad Adams. Uh, it's called The Book of Hope. She tells this story in the midst of the book about two men in China, two friends. I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce their names correctly, and for that I apologize. Jia Hasya and Jia Wenqi. So they've been friends since they were boys. And here's the thing, Hasya was blind in one eye from birth and then in an accident lost his sight in his other eye. So as a young man, he became completely blind. And his friend Wenqi lost both of his arms in his arms in an accident when he was just three years old. So two friends, one blind and one with no arms. When when she lost his arms in this accident, a factory accident, uh, excuse me, when, ha when Haisya lost his sight in his accident, he became depressed. And his friend thought he needed something to do to lift his spirit, something, uh, some way of his being of use. So the land around their rural village, and this is true in so many parts of the world, of course, had become degraded for a whole variety of reasons, pollution over over grazing, uh, farming, and so on. Uh, so they wondered if, when she wondered if they could plant trees to begin reclaiming the land. Now, how could they do this, these two, with their uh, situations? One blind, one with no arms. Well, they couldn't afford, because they were also poor, they couldn't afford to buy seeds or saplings. They had no money. So they cloned new trees uh, from cuttings from, from other saplings. How did they do this? Well, Ha Xia did the cutting while Wen Shi directed him to the right place. Ha Xia holding on to one of 
when she's empty sleeves. Imagine this picture. And they went around planting these cuttings uh, from saplings. It didn't work out very well at first. Trees were dying and they didn't have adequate water. Somehow Jane Goodall couldn't recall or didn't know how they managed it, but they managed to get a source of water to the trees. And after a while they began thriving. They have planted 10,000 trees. And the villagers who were who'd been skeptical at first, they didn't think this was gonna work out. I mean, what would you think? What would we think? They began to take on the care of the trees, 10,000 trees, contributing of course to the reclaiming of the land, contributing to uh, the, in relation to the climate crisis, two friends, unlikely, and I don't know about you, but that story gives me hope. I mean, if they can, <laughs> if they can carry this off, what are we doing? <laughs> uh, inspiring, pretty cool story. We come to our time of sharing joys, sorrows, and concerns. First memory, some of you, I hope most of you saw in our sad news email yesterday. The first candle is in memory of our dear friend, longtime member, Ernie Sophus. Ernie and Mary have been living um, in Bedford for some time. Ernie died peacefully the other morning, Friday morning. Mary was by his side. One of their daughters, Soph, was by their side. Ernie, this kind, warm, congenial person, Ernie and Mary would sit right about over where Donna was. They used to sit and Ernie would stand up now and then. He was leading the, some of the Father Bill's teams, making meals at Father Bill's for years. And he'd go beyond that. Father Bill's needs towels. Father Bill's needs uh, bedding, whatever. And he'd encourage us all to bring things in. Um, he wouldn't make us feel bad about not doing it. He'd make us want to do it <laughs> in his hospitable way. That was his career, hospitality. I mean, his actual career. And it was his life, always ready to help and serve. Well, the memorial service will be this Thursday afternoon, Veterans Day for this proud veteran at two o'clock right here and also on Zoom, we'll send the link out uh, in the Tuesday weekly update. So you're welcome to attend either way, Thursday afternoon at two. Let us share a moment of silent memory as I light that first candle for Ernie and also with Mary and their daughters and grandchildren in our hearts. Those who have been with us here and are gone from our physical presence always live in our hearts. Ernie is one of this great cloud of witnesses. Uh, Jane Street's daughter, Jennifer, has asked me to light a candle for Jane. Jane's had some serious health uh, issues the past couple of weeks, was in the hospital for a bit. I visited with her yesterday. She's in good spirits, but it's tough. Uh, her daughters are taking turns being with her, so she's not alone in the house. Uh, she is still very much Jane in all the good ways. So we light this candle for Jane for her health and well being. If there are any in the room here who have a joy or sorrow you'd like to share, I invite you to stand. Keep yourselves masked, please, and I will light a candle. Yes. Oh, goodness. Yes, this candle uh, of concern for you and your accident 
in the car, but uh, your gratitude that no one was hurt. Thank you. Connie. Thank you, Connie. This is a candle of thanks to Pat, sitting with Connie in the pew, Pat Bianco, for the beautiful flowers this morning. She did for Connie in her remembrance and Pat's ability to take something ordinary, as you put it, and make it beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, Kate. Yes. Oh yeah, a candle of concern, Kate, for your brother who had knee surgery and an infection with C. diff, which is a serious infection. We hold him in our hearts and you for his recovery and well-being. Yes. Wonderful. So Karen, first welcome as a newcomer, but longtime Unitarian Universalist. Welcome. Uh, but this candle for your dad and for your joy at being able to visit him in Connecticut today, along with your siblings and celebrating his 87th birthday. Wish him congratulations from all of us, right? From all of us, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, David, congratulations, a candle of joy for your sculpture being accepted in a juried selection at South Shore Art Center, part of an exhibit, Black Lives and White Fragility. We look forward to getting over there and seeing it. Congratulations, a candle burns for that accomplishment and joy. Heather. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to light a candle of gratitude uh, for the gender in the 21st century class that Abby and Diane have been running the last month or so. It's been a great, really eye-opening experience, uh, and it's been great to be part of the community unpacking that. So thanks. I think we all heard it. Thank you. A candle of joy for that well-led and important class. Thanks, Heather. Yes. Ah, thank you, Sierra. One of your favorite residents at work, I think you're up at Linden Ponds, turned 81 on Wednesday. Celebrate with him. Babeline, do we have any joys or sorrows or concerns on chat? So we have a candle of um, memory and honor for the life of Colin Powell, who was laid to rest this past Friday. And uh, I think that's all we had. Mary uh, Thomas had her hand raised, but um, we're not able to, un to mute her. Or, um, so I take it that she may have a candle of joy or concern, but I don't know how um, we might find that because it's not in the chat. Okay, I think we've unmuted her, so. Oh, okay, you're unmuted now. You can talk. Hello, uh, this is Mary, and I'd like to light a candle of joy for my sister's visit uh, with me for the last week. Uh, she has been visiting from Santa Monica, California, and she spent the week here at Linden Ponds. There she is, <laughs> and uh, it has been a joy and a whirlwind. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mary. And so I think Thanks. that takes care of the joys and concerns in the chat, Ken. Uh, and so a candle burns for Colin Powell in remembrance and a candle for the joy of your visit, Mary, with your sister who many of us remember well. And these candles burn as well for any joys, sorrows, concerns deeply felt in our hearts this day, though they've remained unspoken in words. And with that, we will sing any of our youth or kids out and their adult companions uh, for programs across the street, which I believe is mostly bikes, not bombs. Oh, now in peace, oh, now in peace, lay up to You just figure it out. And I really appreciate that, Christopher. That's beautiful. Thank you. Our anthem. to a time of meditation, of prayer, and of silence. May we first simply breathe into presence. Whatever thoughts are arising, they arise. And then they pass. Arise and pass. Whatever feelings we have this day, in the midst of whatever our lives have, bring, have brought this day, our feelings arise and they pass. Arise 
and pass as we sit with one another in the quiet of this shared space. In the midst of our thoughts and feelings, yearnings of the heart may arise. Prayers, another name. Prayers for those who grieve, for Ernie's family, for those who loved Colin Powell in family and dear friends, for all here who grieve, whether loss is recent or more distant, we pray for peace and comfort. Prayers for those who are facing the challenge of illness, as we've heard this morning, for their health, their well being, for the comfort that they need. Prayers that we might be among those who bring peace to our troubled land and to the conversations too often divisive and angry. May we be among those who bring peace, who bring understanding and mutual respect. Prayers for this dear earth of gratitude for those who plant trees, of gratitude for those who do what they can do to heal and help one another, our nation, our dear earth. May we continue our meditations and prayers in shared and renewing and peaceful silence.
reader this morning is Paul Kelly. Paul, thanks so much for my reading. Our reading this morning is from the Book of Hope by Jane Goodall and Douglas Adams. In this passage, Jane Goodall writes the following. Remember that we have been gifted not only with a clever brain and well-developed capacity for love and compassion, but also with an indomitable spirit. We all have this fighting spirit, only some people don't reach, realize it. We can try to nurture it, give it a chance to spread its wings and fly out into the world, giving other people hope and courage. It is no good to deny that there are problems. There's no shame if you think about the harm we've inflicted about on the world. But if you concentrate on doing the things you can do and doing them well, it will make all the difference. Let us use this gift of our lives to make this a better world for the sake of our children and theirs, for the sake of those struggling in poverty, for the sake of the lonely, and for the sake of our brothers and sisters in the natural world, the animals, the plants, and the trees. Please, please rise to the challenge, inspire and help those around you play your part. Find your reasons for hope and let them guide you onward. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Paul. Our morning offering may be placed as you leave, if you're here in the building, in our basket as you leave this way or in a basket as you leave that way. And whether you're here in the room or on the screen, we can leave, we can make our offering through the donate link on our website. And each week we can, uh, when we use the donate link, we can donate to our Sunday plate offering, our ongoing ministries, that means, or to our special plate offering for the month. Uh, in November, as I expect most of you know by now, our outreach offering will be given to free, period. This local organization right here in Hingham provides feminine hygiene products to those who cannot afford them. Benefits do not cover them. This is, of course, an important need that can be filled and helped through our donations. Thank you in advance. And thank you as well. To all those who have brought food, I see a, a bag of food in the basket, either here or across the street in the vestibule. This too helps uh, in one of our ministries, serving others, serving those who are in need. Thank you for those gifts as well. Our morning offering will now be given and received as we hear the offertory.
So sermon title, if you haven't read it yet, is Why Hope? And Paul's, St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, there's this famous passage about love, right? Many of you are familiar with it. Poetic about the nature of love, affirming that whatever else we have, whatever else, whoever else, however we behave, if we have not love, if we have not love, you can probably say it with me, we are but a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. Was it something I said? <laughs> I think we're going to get to hear them from the choir loft later on. <laughs> if we have not love, we're a noisy gong or a clanging symbol, or worse, he goes on to say nothing. It's as if we're nothing. And he concludes with these often quoted lines, and now faith, hope, and love abide. The greatest of these is love. So hope is there, but it's not the most prominent. It's, uh, it seems to me almost subservient in a way, not in a negative sense, but it serves love. So what might this mean? It might depend on what we mean by hope and what we mean by love. If, if hope is no more than wishful thinking and love is just passive sentiment, well, then we've got plenty of noisy gongs to go around. But if hope for how things might be, how our life might be, is, becomes a vision, and, and if love, sure, it's a feeling. If it's also an active verb, well, that's another matter altogether, isn't it? And this is what Jane Goodall seems to me, though, not using language from the Bible. It's what she's preaching in her, in her book of hope. A Survival Guide for Trying Times. That's the subtitle from which we heard earlier from Paul, uh, another Paul. <laughs> yes, have your vision, your hope as to how things might be, how you would like them to be, and but not necessarily on a global scale, even in our own lives, certainly. Have your hope and then do something about it. Again, whether it's our personal lives or on larger, larger field. When it comes to our personal lives, it's pretty clear, isn't it? If you're about to take a test, you hope you're gonna do well, but you haven't studied. That hope isn't worth the piece of paper you might write the exam on. And I can hope as a runner that I might do well in a race, but if I haven't trained properly, that's not gonna get me to the finish line, at least not, hope will not get me to the finish line by itself, at least not in very good shape. You know, all the runners today in the New York Marathon, they hope they're going to do well. Uh, and the hope will be a help. Having the vision. But it won't get them far if they haven't done the training. We can hope that we'll recover from the flu or from a cold. You know, but if you don't rest and drink plenty of fluids and all that, our recovery will be slow. We might even get sicker and so on. So we know that hope has to be also a kind of active Verb. In her book, Jane Goodall makes the same point in regard to matters as challenging as two on a global scale that are close to her heart, the loss of biodiversity and, of course, the climate crisis. And this general principle of hope paired with love leading to action applies, of course, to all the issues we face, whether racism or poverty, hunger, and so on. We can hope, but not much happens if that's all it is. It's not powered. The hope leading to action is not powered by love, nor a genuine concern when we see a problem, our friend, or just knowing that people are hungry and so on. And here's the thing, once we pitch in on whatever project or task, others will see and be inspired and maybe help. It might be as simple as beginning to fold the chairs after a meeting. We experience that across the street all the time after a meeting. Somebody starts folding a chair and soon everybody, oh yeah, I can help. Uh, you know, all those who are able will help. Those two men in rural China, they didn't, they didn't ask everybody to help them. They just went about doing what they wanted to do for their own reasons, but people saw it and started to pitch in, started to help and care for those trees. So before you know it, whether it's moving chairs in the fellowship hall or planting trees, whatever it might be, before you know it, you've got a movement. You know this story. In August of 2018, Greta Thunberg uh, decided 
that she would stand, not go to school and stand in front of the Swedish parliament, probably had some sort of sign, you know, on strike until you do something about the climate crisis. One person, 15 year old to boot. Well, after a while, other students in her community and in surrounding communities joined her. Before long, it was a student strike across Europe and then it uh, infected in a good way around the globe students. Uh, a year later, year after that, Greta was speaking before the United Nations General Assembly. And of course, she's still at it. A couple of years, she's now speaking at the Glasgow Climate Summit. And she's far from alone. Her love of the planet, which moved her to action, has moved others, millions with a hope, expectation. She started with a hope, maybe others will listen, maybe others will join in, but she didn't count on it. She just did it. And now there are millions of young people and others inspired and making more of a difference than they might have been already. Back to Jane Goodall, at the other end, we might say of the age spectrum, uh, before long, she'll be 90, still at it. And she's probably aware, as aware of anyone on the planet of all the crises we face interrelated from the suffering of poverty to the crisis of climate. Well, if Jane Goodall still has hope in our ability to address these challenges, to meet them and to do things about it, her organization, Roots and Shoots, and she's speaking when COVID hit, she just started speaking uh, to her computer uh, to people around the world. Well, if she can still hope, and believes that we have the ability to meet all these challenges, then who am I to sit on my hand, right? Now her reasons for hope, she gives a few, four actually, she names four things. Uh, I can't go into lots of detail, you can get the little book. She names her, she names our amazing human intellect. Now that's all it is, it gets us in trouble too often, but our, our intellect, our ability to see a problem, analyze it, come up with a technology or a way to deal with the problem. We have this amazing human intellect. That's one of her grounds for hope. And the incredible resilience of nature. We know it's not, you know, there was that land around that rural village that had been de degraded, but start planting a few trees, other creatures start coming in again and it reclaims. Nature wants to heal. The same way if we scratch ourselves or injure ourselves, our body wants to heal. The body of Earth is the same, the incredible resilience of nature. And then her third reason for hope, the, determin the determination and energy of young people around the world. You see that in the movement that Greta Thunberg spurred. You see that in the Sunrise Movement. You see that uh, the demonstrations in Glasgow is filled with young people. She sees this and this energy. We can't, we who are older can't depend on it. And say, okay, we're done, you do it. But that energy can give us all a little more hope of what can be accomplished. And then finally, her fourth, the indomitable, our indomitable human spirit, coupled, as you heard in the reading, with our capacity for love and compassion. You know, we see this spirit quite personally often. We don't think we have it. We see somebody who's living with a terrible diagnosis, cancer. And we, you know, how do they do that every day? And they're still getting up and they're still you know, doing this or being this way. And so how do they do it? I could never do that, we're inclined to say. And I've heard people say that. And then when the time comes when they're facing the challenge, more often than not, they rise to it also. And you've got an indomitable human spirit, not unquenchable, Circumstances can douse the flame, but it's there. And it's more likely to be and the flame of that spirit, more likely to be uh, not just kindled, but uh, spread if there are more of us together sharing, right? But none of these four reasons just magically by themselves will solve all of our problems uh, and bring about the change that we desperately need in our nation and around the world, um, it's not magic. Again, we have to do something. Remember that Pete Seeger song uh, written late in his life, God's Counting on Me, God's Counting on You, it was written late uh, in his long life of action. 
glad you didn't see this earlier. You might have gone the other way. But... <laughs> God's counting. On... We're not going to sing the whole thing, but uh, this is, he sometimes was a lone voice. I've shared this story. A friend of his one day, rainy day on Route 9 in just upstate New York, and they saw somebody, they couldn't tell who it was, standing alone with a sign that said, peace. So this friend, as it turned out, friend of Pete's, he turns around, of course it's Pete. He hadn't called a news conference. He, and he just felt one morning he got up, you know, I got to stand up and witness. And he did, right till the end of his life. And he wrote this song of Laura Wyatt. And it's, it's the message we're talking about today. When we look and we see things that should not be, God's counting on me. God's counting on me. Hoping we'll all pull through. Hoping we'll all pull through. Hoping we'll all pull through. Me and you. Some of the other lyrics. Don't give up. Don't give in. Working together, we all can win. God's counting on me. God's counting on you. There's big problems to be solved. Let's get everyone involved. That's the everyone part. God's counting on me. God's counting on you. And what we do now, you and me, will affect eternity. God's counting on me. God's counting on you. When we sing with younger folks, it's the young people. We can never give up hope. God's counting on me. God's counting on you. So sing quietly, hope. Hope we all pull through. Hope we all pull through. Hope we all pull through. Me and you. I got a couple more things to say before I'm done. Channeled Pete Seeger. It ought to be done now and then. This afternoon, by the way, I'll be preaching in Cambria, California. Uh, my To Everything a Season sermon. I'm preaching from here, of course. I've done this a couple of times. I have an old friend who lives out there. And uh, she's going to sing, turn, turn, turn. She's a fine musician. So Pete will be channeled again this afternoon. Anyway, all this said and sung. As I was musing about hope these past couple of weeks, having given myself the challenge of this sermon title, Why Hope? Uh, for a while, I thought during these past couple of weeks, you know, so just forget about hope, just do stuff. We don't, we don't need hope, just get out there and do. You know, whether it's in our personal lives or hope for this or hope for that or, or in the world, just, just do it. Don't bother with hope. But that would actually be impossible, wouldn't it? Hope is so darn human. It's human to hope, to hope for our sick loved, sick loved one to get better, or at least uh, not to suffer, find peace. Um, to hope for our own uh, personal challenge, whether it's financial or, or uh, health or spiritual challenge, to pass, to hope. Um, that's just human. On the larger scale, to hope for improvement in this national conversation, so-called and to hope for meeting all these larger crises. Of course, we human beings hope. And if hope can give rise to a vision of how we want things to be, on whatever scale of our lives, then that vision can lead us to be doing what needs to be done, powered by love. We don't hope unless we love. We want to care for someone or care for the planet and so on. So back to the Bible, the book of Proverbs this time said, uh, without vision, the people perish. Seems to me just as without hope, we are liable to despair, to perish spiritually, you might say. But a vision, a hope, gives us something to reach for and something to do to get there. So this said, one last and I think important thought, uh, wisdom from many sources expressed with particular clarity, it seems to me, in the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, reminds us to act, yes. If you're alive, you act. Reminds us to act, but without attachment to the fruits of our actions. 
Yes, have a goal, have a reason to act, something to strive for, but then just do what you're called to do, do what you're able to do with your particular gifts in the direction of your vision, your hope, however small or large, while letting go of complete control because we don't have it over the results, how it will all turn out. You know, I'm struck, as I thought some more about this, I'm struck by the fact that Jesus in the Gospels, he didn't talk much at all about hope. Paul did. Christian church does. That's okay. But Jesus didn't. Um, Jesus most simply and directly talked about how to be in the world, how to be with one another, how to be with your neighbor, how to tend to those who are poor or otherwise um, outcasts, how to love one another, in other words. That's what he was about. That's all. And that's everything, isn't it? So in this spirit, may we do our best to live with one another, in our families, in our circles of friends, in our various communities, assuredly here, including here at Old Ship. I know this is what we do try to do, to, as I said a couple of weeks ago, to, to grow love in our community and in our hearts, and then as citizens of our nation, as travelers on the earth. As I said the other night at our parish meeting, we don't and can't know what the future will bring. But we surely do know what we can bring to the future and to one another in this shared journey we call our lives and that we call a journey of love. So may it long and always be. In that same spirit, as I extinguish the flames lit with love, as I extinguish the flame of our chalice, lit to remind us of our values of love and truth and freedom, I cannot extinguish the love. We carry that with us wherever we go. Closing hymn, which you can sing robustly at home or sing very quietly or hum here is As We Sing of Hope and Joy, number 1060. So you'll find that in your soft covered hymn book, 1060, As We Sing of Hope and Joy.
be lives filled with hope and joy that we might bring hope, bring joy, bring a blessing to all of our friends, our neighbors, all who we meet in our life's journey of love. May it be so. Blessed be and amen.